Welcome to episode number two of Fit Pet Boston Talks. I sat down recently with Laurie Lodato and we talked about how she became the dog trainer that she is today. We talked about leaving her profession and nutrition behind, her battle with illness, her amazing dogs, and what kind of dog trainer she is. So listen up and enjoy the stories. So how'd you get into it? How did it get started? What was the road like? Uh, We had family dogs, but I didn't really show much interest. It was sort of like your parents get you a dog to shut the kids up. And I didn't really take part in training them or anything substantial, you know, cleaning the yard when you're supposed to after the dog. Uh, They One was our first family dog was my dad's dog. And the second family dog was my mother's. Um, yeah, so I didn't play much part in that. I ended up getting a yellow Labrador retriever in 2003. So I had finished college. I had my, I majored in nutrition. I minored in bio and psych, got a great job at a local hospital. I worked there for about a year and then in 2003... I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and it was supposed to be quick. The me, like my chemotherapy, everything that they thought I would need. I was looking at like a six month period to get rid of it, but that's not how it worked out. So anyway, during this time I thought, well, I'm not at work. This is a perfect time to get a dog. Plus, I needed a friend. And any job I have, I tend to work 24-7. So I thought, what better time to not even thinking about the future or what job I would have or if my dog would be alone or any of those things. I just thought, I need a friend. Let me get a dog. I ended up... So so I get this little yellow lab... So this was before, like, the internet could give you a prompt for a breeder? Or oh, please, this is the newspaper. Much, okay. This is like... <laughs> like the want ad? <laughs> yeah. This is, you're going to get a lab, and so you look at you look at the newspaper, you look what they have. This is when they would be like, oh, we have four females, five males, this is the cost, AKC. It's all a lie. Like, it, it's not like it is today where you research them to death. You You can find anything you need online. This is newspaper. So I drive to this place, I get the lab. So she's a nightmare. I mean, I'm sick and I don't know how to train a dog. And, and that those two things combined were a nightmare. I remember walking, one, I thought that she was trying to kill me because she was so mouthy and nippy, like everyone's usual problems with a, with a puppy. They're nippy, they're jumping on things. Like she would... I walked outside once. She's standing on the picnic table. Um, and one time in the middle of the night, she had to pee. It took me like 20 years to get all my, my boots on, my raincoat. She peed all over the floor. And it wasn't just, it was like a river. Anyway, I thought she was trying to kill me with the biting and the nipping. And that's when I went to a trainer, um, a local trainer here in Mass at the time. And... I don't know. I like took off from, from there. I was, I continued, uh, my therapy well beyond what they said. And I ended up getting a autologous stem cell transplant. So I was, they gave me a timeline of you'd be better in six months. And so it ended up being a year and a half of my life. And when did you, um, get Bella in that like six month period? Like, was it like three months Uh, in, four months in? It was probably about four months in. So it was a good like year and some change that you were still like actively getting treatments and oh, trying yeah. to Yep, somebody had to take puppy. care of her while I was getting my transplant and I brought her to um a local day school where she would learn throughout the day because I was either in chemo or I just didn't have the energy to 
to do it. So I brought her to school because I wanted her to keep learning and she did so well. And once I had the tools and I knew what I was supposed to do, I worked with her every day. So she was the reason that she ended up, she did end up being my friend, but I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning. So once I had the tools and I did what the trainer said and all those behaviors went away and we did well together. Awesome. So Thankfully, you got better from the cancer, Mm -hmm. recovered. And so your life was on this trajectory towards, you know, I graduated with a nutrition degree. You were working as a nutritionist before you got cancer. And then because of the relationship that you had with Bella after and, you know, during the spell, it kind of pushed you into... Well, Uh I started taking, I liked it so much and I did pretty well. So the person who was training me, the trainer, uh, she said, well, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to, I needed, so I was out of work obviously because I was sick, but I was, so I ended up helping her transport the dogs around because she would be boarding dogs here and there. And so I would take those dogs for walks all day. Right. So I'd, you know, throw up inside the van because I was sick and then I would take the dogs for a walk because I didn't really like to be still and I always think that if you're still or you're not doing something my this is my my own opinion is I feel like I'll get lazy so I just continue to press on so I just had my dog with me for the rest of the day too with all these other dogs and then I ended up training them And it just gave me a reason to get up every day until I couldn't do it anymore. So I did it periodically here and there for her, not every day of the week. Um, After I finished my treatment, she said, well, what are you going to do now? So when I finished treatment, I didn't want to be in a hospital anymore because I was there all the time. So I said, you know, sure. She offered me to... She's, she was looking at a kennel at the time. And so I said, sure, I'll help you in the kennel. So my whole life became dog training after that. I moved, I moved to, it was a kennel in New Hampshire. So I moved to a kennel in New Hampshire and I worked there 24 seven. Right. And as far as like having an expectation for following through with your degree, um, did you kind of not look back once you headed up there after you made a recovery and realized it was something that you really liked to do? I don't think I was really good at nutrition anyway. <laughs> I liked I liked the psych the psychological part. I liked psychology, but right. I, I didn't care much for the nutrition part. I wasn't good at it and I struggled in college. Okay. And I I just didn't want to go back to the hospital after that. It was I was kind of it was just all you know, it was just the ball was rolling and that's it. I was, I was in it. So right. I just kept, I just kept doing it and I was learning more and more about dogs, but I was also thrown into a situation where I didn't know everything about dogs, but next thing I know I'm taking care of 60 dogs in a kennel and I was completely overwhelmed. Right. But I faked it till I made it. Right. <laughs> <sighs> I did. No one got hurt. <laughs> no, nobody got hurt. I did a good job. I was smart. Yeah. So. And do you think like some people, as far as that smartness goes, is, you know, just being able to like read a situation, read a dog. Do you think that some people have a little bit more of it than others? They have more than others. I think if... I think sometimes people who are who who are a little more cocky tend to get bit <laughs> <laughs> because they're like, "Oh, this dog's not going to bite me or I can handle this or I'm not right. worried or or like this dog isn't going to, you know, like they're not going to tell me what to do or I have the upper hand or and when once people throw around that alpha crab I'm the alpha I think that those people aren't more careful of their actions right yeah 
Or, and, or we're just so overwhelmed with work at the time that we do something stupid, like re- reach into a crate to get a dog and you get bit by accident. Yep. I mean, it's, it's an innocent thing like that where the person has all good intentions you know, and then, you know, we, we berate ourselves afterwards for making a stupid mistake or it's just somebody who's really cocky. Right. And they don't respect the dog's space. Right. Because it's not always catering to a dog when you give them space. That's ridiculous. What do you mean by that? Like, I remember one situation with a woman and there was a dog walking away from her the dog was deaf and that wasn't even really it it wasn't a space issue she got mad because she told the dog to kennel up this is a random helper she told the dog to kennel up the dog didn't do it and she thought you have to listen to me and she grabbed the dog by the collar from behind Hmm. people rushing around really gets People rushing around is terrible. And you're talking about in a kennel environment with a lot any of, environment. A lot of things, well, any if you're environment. rushing around and your head's going crazy and you're not into it, then some somebody usually you can get hurt that way. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility for one person, especially like, you know, having the experience, but just kind of relying on your instincts because, <laughs> because you don't. You know, you've never been in that situation before. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I was just thrown into it. Exactly like me in the beginning, just far less dogs. It was <laughs> it was trial by fire. Yep. And she took care of some dogs who were a little more... Aggressive. Yes. Yeah, more aggressive. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. They do yeah. exist. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you had Bella with you in this situation. Yeah, she loved it. Um... She was a field lab. She hung out. So what was your relationship like with her? Like as far as, you know, having a connection? Because one of the things that just totally blew my mind when I first met you and we started hanging out, um, we went on a walk uh, with Rippa and she didn't have any collar on or anything. I think you just took the leash and you looped it over her head. And we walked down to the, or maybe she had her fur saver on, but I have this like memory of her having just a leash like looped around her head. Anyway, we walked down to the pond and we're walking and you just like seamlessly took the leash off. I don't even remember when it happened. And there's like no difference between Ripple walking on leash or off leash. Like her obedience was still great, but she just hung out and she hung around and I remember asking you know why don't you put dog tags on your dogs and you said well my dogs will never leave me and I totally didn't get it like at all I was like this girl thinks that she just has you you thought I was being cocky and I wasn't I know now I know because you you heard it the wrong way yeah I heard it the wrong way because I I had never had my own personal dog um I had taking care of other people's dogs for extended periods of time. But I never had that relationship with a dog that I knew that the dog wasn't going to leave me. And at the time I was walking other people's dogs and I had quite a few that were flight risks. You know, you wouldn't want them to be just like walking around willy nilly. They'll run away. Um, So it was like a constant fear that I had. And I didn't really realize what that meant until I had it with Ruben and he, but still it was just this moment where i was like whoa like these dogs like she has no doubt that they will stay with her like that's unbelievable no it's easier to have your own dog because you can control all the variables but when you're training other people it's harder because you're not there to cover all their mistakes which right. is why i started taking them for the day to train them and right. my relationship wasn't like that with bella i was a bad trainer with bella I lost my temper. Um, I got irritated with the dog, but it wasn't her fault. Plus, I was sick, and so I didn't have as much patience as I should have, and I always tell people if they get aggravated with their dog, which is normal, if the dog doesn't do something or the dog does something that bothers you, that you need to step away because then you're just a crappy dog trainer. 
and just a bad person in general because you can't pull it together. So with Bella, I did not have a good relationship with her in the beginning. I started training her and it was fine, but she had spent such a significant period of time with the trainer that I was working with that she had a better relationship with her. It was only after I started feeling better and taking Bella to the woods every day and running her every morning because even though I was sick, I made this effort that if I did one thing during the day, and I did, I would get up, take a shower, and take care of my dog. So those were my goals. I think Bella came into my life at the right time, but I didn't I didn't necessarily know it. I was just looking for a friend, and then she wasn't my friend because she was torture to be with because she was killing me with the nipping and the mouthing and everything else. But my relationship with her, it wasn't... I had to work on it every day, mm. like just because she had the foundation in it from this other trainer, but she, she didn't bond with me, which is right. sometimes the downside of sending your dog off to somebody to, to me to be trained. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because it's something that you really believe in and it's also something that's becoming more and more popular for people to do. So can you just kind of break it down if someone's listening and they don't really know what you're talking about? Um, you know, the age of the dog, the type of training that you're talking about and kind of just how it all works. Like you training an individual to train their own dog versus a board and train. I like one-on-one private classes with people because it gives them responsibility when they go home and they have to do the work. Board and trains are, are good. Like I, I would never take that you know, business away from anyone, but it's such an influential time in a dog's life from eight weeks old to 16 weeks, four months. I, I couldn't imagine having someone else train my dog during that time because that's the time that you put everything into it where there's, they're not so easy to train. Some dogs are my my our our Rottweiler was like impossible to train as a puppy, not my not Rippa. This um, it was our male puppy who's an awesome adult dog, but it was hard to get his focus. But I had to work on it every day, and I just think people have a better bond with their dog if they work on it. I think if the dog is an older dog that has a lot of issues, and a lot of it's in the environment, and you want to break them free of that environment to just give them a whole new world and a whole different structure. I think that board and trains are helpful then, especially if you're considering using electric collar training. So I had one family recently where the dog is much older. She doesn't have any guidelines in the house. She's not food driven. She, they tried crating her and training her. And like every time they would take her out of the crate, she'd be learning. That still wasn't working. She would just refuse food for days and days on end. She really had no, she just did not care about them. She didn't, she rarely looked up at them, rarely focused on them, no matter what they had, whatever high value treat you could give. And she did not care about correction because they did use, uh, we did use a prong collar and that wasn't working. And so in that case, I did recommend a board and train someplace else to pull her out of the environment and just try to restart her again. So for that, fine. But to get rid of a small puppy, to, to get rid of a dog at such a young age, like, like an eight week old puppy, I don't, I don't, it's just my opinion that I wouldn't do it because it's such a good bonding time with family. Yeah. And that's an important uh, thing to note is like, you know, I mean, our vet says if they come back as a dog in another life that they'd want to live with you. <laughs> so the way that you approach dog ownership is, to me, super authentic. So I think that that advice, you know, if anybody's listening and you have a puppy, you know, just having that 8 to 16 uh, week old time with your dog, um, you know, which is you're saying that that's like gold. Yeah. You know, I feel like that's the best time to bond with the dog. Right. And it's, yeah. it's the hardest time. And set the rules in the house. I just, you know, 
it's just so important to me that time. And it's really hard to have a puppy. I don't think people realize it. Mm. How, like it just turns your whole house around, especially if you have kids and then you're running around with the kids trying to bring them everywhere and you're an Uber and you're a mom and you're trying to do everything that moms do or maybe you're a single dad or even if you have a husband and a wife, everyone's going in every direction trying to take care of everything in the house and now you have, it's almost like another baby comes into the house. Right. That doesn't last as long in the baby stage. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, if it's a baby, nobody puts an actual baby on the floor and wings it. They're like, oh, good job. Like, go figure out that diaper change yourself. Or like, (laughs) oh, oh, don't worry. You're going to learn off your older brother. He's going to teach you. Nobody does that. But when people get a new puppy, they're like, yeah, we just let him walk around the house. We slapped a pen up. You know, still to this day, people put newspapers in their house. It blows my mind. (laughs) It blows my mind. Like who, who wants a dog who's 40 pounds 50 pounds, 60 pounds. They're like, oh, they've always gone in the newspaper. Like male dogs <laughs> lift their leg. Like, what are you doing? Or like, you get a second dog and they're like, oh, like 10 year old Rover is going to teach little Mikey now how to, <laughs> how to walk on a leash and how to be behaved. And no, that's just not right. Right. <laughs> that's what everybody does. No, we'll get another dog to entertain the old dog. Old dog hates your puppy. They hate the new puppy. So don't get one. Don't get a new puppy for the dog. They don't want that. They're not going to... It's a very rare occasion where I see the old dog spring to life when a new fuzzball walks into the door. Yeah, we had to go like out of our way when we got the boys to make sure that they didn't interact with our older dog. Yeah, I, I don't like. think it's necessary for a puppy to bond with the older dog over the person because, unfortunately, your old dog goes away. Right. And if your old dog goes away and your puppy bonded with him the whole time, he's lost when they leave. Right. So you always have to teach the dog to bond to the person. Right. Man's best friend, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's a ton of work. Yes. It's good. It has mm-hmm. a great payoff. I don't want to be, you know, like, I don't like to be the negative person and say, no, don't get a dog or don't. I mean, I've seen some people really rise to the occasion. We were talking about this the other day. Mm-hmm. And they love their animal. So, you know, it's really the second dog thing lately has been a lot for families. It's just like people feel compelled to get that second dog. To... Yeah. And they don't even train the first one. Yeah. I think it's guilt. I think it's some good old fashioned guilt. If they're not around as much, they think that they're just going to entertain each other. Yeah, but it takes forever for a puppy to like be be able to be alone right or to be normal right they're psychotic little piranhas yeah they're demons yeah yeah and then they eat the kids oh we just need to teach like little Susie. we we just have to teach we have to teach who who we're gonna call him what's every dog's name brady we're gonna teach brady We're going to teach Brady not to eat the children and the children, when I go into the house and the kids are running around and, you know, Susie has a tutu on and the dog's jumping up, grabbing her, grabbing her clothes, grabbing everything. She runs up on the sofa and screams. The puppy starts chasing her. It's a nightmare. (laughs) It's just hard. And it's hard for us to have rules, especially when that's kind of not the way that the rest of our society is moving, right? So people don't want to slap rules on anything or tell anybody what to do. No. Nope. That was like the tough part is a couple of classes I've had is just, you know, trying to explain to the owner that it's a dog and he shouldn't just be allowed to do whatever he wants because then he's just going to always do whatever he wants and there's going to be no respect for you and so if that's your mindset don't expect that suddenly the light's going to go off and you're going to be able to ask of your dog and they're they're going to do it you know if you've given them all this freedom beforehand but i think it's just because people feel bad people always feel bad with animals way more than they do with children yeah (laughs) like they'll put the smack down on a kid well before they'll put it on a you know or just apply some rules for an animal right Especially if it's a rescue, rescue animal, I think. Rescue dog. Yes, because then they're like, oh, this dog had such a terrible terrible life life and we're going to give it the best life by letting it run around the front yard, get lost and get hit by a car. Right. (laughs) I don't know. That's like a really, that's the worst case scenario. 
Because if you don't put rules in, your dog, like something terrible can happen. Right. And kids leave front doors open or they leave the gates open and all because your dog. It's just a terrible circumstance. Right. If you don't train the dog and you shouldn't feel bad. If you get a rescue, you should feel so happy that you gave this dog an amazing home and now you're going to add structure to its life. Right. Yep. I know even still with Ruben, right? We got him as a puppy, but he still has like reactivity. We couldn't, couldn't uh, anticipate, but we just have to manage it by being really strict. Yeah. I think once we, I mean, it's, I think it's important for all of us who have dogs to know that our dog's weaknesses, even if we wouldn't want to admit it. Right. Because nobody ever wants to admit that their dog has a personality trait that's slightly unattractive. (laughs) You know, or if you get a dog that's supposed to be tough, you don't want to say that it's a super sensitive dog. You want to think that it's a a harder personality. Right. I get that. It's okay um, to admit that your dog is imperfect, that they have these little quirks, but then you learn how to manage it. So that's that's what people should focus on. They shouldn't focus on, oh, my dog does this and this. It should just be like, oh, my dog has this thing, so I've learned how to manage it, and now we're doing okay. Right. But I know what makes them tick. Right. And I have seen, like, Ruben change. You know, like, he definitely isn't the same guy that he was a year ago, and... Just having that expectation for him that this whole process just takes a lot of time has been pretty eye-opening for me and also giving me a little bit of relief because I don't feel like I always have to be training him all the time. You know, I feel like just giving him that time to come into his own and managing what, you know, needs to be, but also like, you know, I was saying to you the other day, like his toy drive has just gone from like, meh, mediocre to like off the charts. He goes nuts when he sees a Frisbee come out and I'm worried that he's actually going to like bite my hand if I don't put him in a sit stay before I present the toy. You know what I mean? He never ever would show that type of um, toy drive and it's just, it's changed. But I think that also realizing that the training takes time, you know, like even if you bring your dog to a board and train facility and they spend a month with your dog like you have to continue it at home yeah and in the long run like a month sure it's like an amount of time but the amount of months that you're going to spend with the dog is going to be forever yeah so i think having that you know that mindset for people that training really does take time and things are going to change and you know we're working with animals it's not like we're working with an iphone um and that's something that I've really had to like embrace about this whole, you know, dog training and dog owning ownership lifestyle is like, you know, we're so used to just getting everything when we, right, right away. away. And it's like, no, you're going to have to do this clicker training and you might not really see the benefit of it for like. Or a not while. clicker training yeah. or using food or, or, yeah, any, or any, other any, training. any other technique that you're using it doesn't, you know, mean that. You, you do it a couple of times and all of a sudden like you have it in the bag and like problem solved, tick, move on to something else. Um, and like, what's the first question everybody asks when we go to their house? How long is this going to take? How long is this going to take? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it's that makes me think that I'm like, oh, once I hear somebody say that in the house, I know that their efforts are going to be not good. Yeah, because they're just waiting for the end and they didn't even start yet. And it takes forever to build good habits or to figure things out. Like I'm 40 years old. It took me forever to figure things out. Like I I, I think it's perfectly fine to, to tell people, you know, put a put the, the first year is the hardest year in a dog's life or right, well, in a dog owner too. It takes a long time to get everything going just right. And then when a behavior, if it does go backwards, you kind of have to start over again. You just have to, it's every time you put your hands on the dog, they're learning. I mean, you don't give up on your kids and say, oh, he already knows everything. We can send him out into the world now. He's great. Right. We don't do that at one years old. Oh, he's one year old. He's good. Put him out there. Let him get a job. He's good. 
But puppies, puppies have to learn how to be bathroom trained in a, in an owner's mind, a puppy has to learn to be bathroom trained in like a good two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And can he signal me at the door in yeah, about a week? The, ring a little bell. <laughs> Nine weeks. Is he gonna always go over to the door? It's really hard. It's really hard in order to prevent accidents. And how long does it take to, to bathroom be... train your kid? Yeah, while. Wow. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's a life. It's a, <laughs> it's life. a life that we lead here. It's a life. <laughs> but I have some really great families. I have great families that do all the work and love their dog and get to enjoy their dog off leash and. They're just part of the whole family unit. Yeah, I agree. And I cling to those families yep. after all these years. I cling to those knowing that, you know, there's a light. After I have a few, like, if I have a few rough classes where the dog doesn't do everything I want or sometimes the people are happy and I'm not happy with the behavior of the dog, but they're happy. So what matters is that the people are happy and the dog is safe. Yep. So it took me a long time after I left the kennel to realize that people all have different goals for their dogs. For example, I went to some old woman's house, an older woman's house, and she wanted her dog to pee on the screened in porch. It was a female, so it wasn't like such a bad thing wasn't a boy on a pad and that's all she wanted and that's all I taught her (laughs) because that's what she wanted and if I went in there and I tried to put any more obedience on the dog that's not what she wanted right and just because I'm a dog trainer who thinks that dogs should do a million different things for you just because I like to work with a dog and I like to see them do really cool things and work around the house and things like that that's not what this woman wanted. And I think sometimes, I think dog trainers should just walk into a house, find out what the people want, and then work on those things. Yeah, and that's more of like a business um, type of mentality as far as, of course, there's ways that you're going to train your dog that, you know, kind of fall in between a super strict competition or even like a canine protection dog and a pet dog, pet dog owner, what they would do. So we're kind of falling in between those two um they're not extremes they're just different ways of owning a dog and as a business person you have to be able to assess okay you know what are the needs of my client and even if they seem completely ridiculous to you you know meet them where they're at obviously you have standards but I think that that's a great example for so many people and I definitely run into it with dog walking so I offer dog training as well as dog walking but you know, some people just don't, they don't need it or they don't want it. It's not something that is as important. So I have to figure out like, okay, can I handle this dog on a daily basis? Can I, can I physically walk this dog? And, you know, is it going to be an issue or is it not going to be an issue? But it's completely okay to assess on a situational base. You know, you have like your standard that you want to train your dog at, you know, and how low will you go? Like how low, (laughs) like how low, how far beneath the pee pad on the screened in porch are you willing to go, you know, to take money from people. But I mean, for her, I'm sure that that was like really freaking helpful. As far as like (laughs) the whole, like, I never want anyone to waste their time or money if they work with me. So, I mean, almost to the point where if somebody's not working with their dog, I'll tell them to stop working with me because they're just wasting their time and their money. Right. So that's always been... I never go into it thinking, how much can I make? Because I think that you lose focus of the dog then. So I never looked at it. I mean, you're a business person and you want to be able to support your business, but I never... I never look at people as just um, a cash register. I do not ever. Yeah. I think either. it's just disres- because I was in the position where I didn't know what to do with my dog and somebody could have raked me over the coals and they didn't. And as far as protection work goes or like I worked with somebody who was very who did Schutzen. So she had very high standards for her dogs. But after uh, my first Rottweiler Ripa 
and it was 10 years ago. I had got a BH on her, but I didn't continue on in Schutzen. I just knew a lot of people. So I got the BH to prove to myself that I could actually do it. I was nervous as hell when I went on the field to get it. Um, even though I had a great dog that was, of course, in heat in my first trial ever. So did she even see the field before the trial? Like, could you take like, her out around the other day? You probably days, couldn't even, like, have her out. Days and days before, but we weren't able to go on the field until the very last. We were the last dogs to trial with another. Um, so can you just back up and talk very briefly about a trial and just so how long your trial was, a couple of things that you had to like do just for people that have no idea what a trial is. I mean, we had practiced all the time for <sighs> when I got Ripa, my, in, my intent was I'm going to train this dog all positive and I'm going to pursue this magical Schutzen title that I've never heard of before. Okay. I had left the kennel, so I had left the person who had trained me. And I continued with other friends that I met and acquaintances in the dog world that I was close to. And every day we were tracking tracking in the morning. So Schutzen has tracking, obedience, and protection. And so I did I did protection work with Ripa. I watched Tons and tons of dogs practice protect. I mean, it was it was what we did on the weekends. You hang out with a bunch of people, all with the same goal to trial their dogs. And we did protection work, and we did tracking, and we found our friends, and we went in the middle of fields in the early morning, laid tracks. Every dog was at a different level. Some of them were way ahead than the others. And honestly, I was so. I had put so much pressure on myself to train the dog that once uh, to train Ripa that once I got the BH, I just like life took over. Hmm. I had, I was just trying to so the find BH a job, is, find is a like life level one of all that. Even before it's even before level one. Okay. So it was, it was just obedience, protection and tracking were not involved. And if I had gone the next level up, obedience and protection would have been involved. And I did the training for it. I was a nervous wreck on the field. Right. I couldn't even believe that I had done it. I think I blacked out the whole time. <laughs> I think I blacked out the whole time I was on the field. Now, how long is a trial for the BH? Is that 45 minutes? Oh, I don't know. I think it's shorter than that. Shorter. So, yeah. Okay, so 20 minutes. You do your healing patterns. Um, that's it. I mean, they do a temperament test. They did a temper temperament test before that, and then you do your... It's very similar to um, the H- getting your CD, B- getting obedience. your, yeah, the BHs, nothing else. But it's basically your healing patterns. Right. And then your dog has to, then at the end of your time, you bring the dog, you have to do, you know, a walking sits and downs. Like I said, I haven't done it in forever. So it's, to me, it's not fair to say that. I was just around a lot of people who did that kind of obedience, and that's why I became such a psycho with obedience. Yeah, um, you, got, you got into it. Because, yeah, Everybody like you learned. We were hanging out with was doing it. Yeah. So where was I? Oh, so, so at, the end of the, at the end of your routine, your dog has to lay down with you out of sight and watch the other dog do, do, its, do com- its. its entire so routine. So if it took 10 minutes, it's really going to take you 20 minutes because your dog is lying down. Yeah. Showing out while the other dog's doing there. I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. So she had to wait all day that day for everybody else because she was in heat, couldn't be around any of the other dogs. It was at the very end of the trial we were able to go. To go, yeah. It sucked. So you had to wait all day. Yeah. Wow. All day, like two days. <laughs> Because everyone had to go. It was, a, it was. So all the people. And that my you nerves were so high and it was pouring rain. Oh, jeez. Pouring rain. My dog was in heat. I remember we had practiced. I would practice in the parking lot with Ripa walking straight lines, just following the parking spaces. So Ripa has seen lines on the ground. Obviously, she's a very solid dog. We got onto the field for the practice days before the trial and somebody had spray painted a line as the start. 
And when she we walked up to the line, she backed up about like 15 feet, like freak, freaked out. Ripa, my solid dog, freaked out and backed up. And I, I was like, oh, we're not, we're going to fail. Okay. Because it's just pass fail uh, for a BH. You don't get points or anything. Usually you get points for protection and points for obedience. And right. I, I just couldn't believe it. The, the heat like wigged her out. Right. Anyway, we got through it. That's I got, awesome. I, I passed it. So basically I'm trying to make the comparison between the extensive type of training that you've done with Ripa that you had done with Ripa, um, doing the tracking and the protection work, but not being tested on it per se. And then, you know, the pet dog training kind of that we do on a regular basis. Yeah. I had to calm down once <laughs> I went to pet training. Like, people don't care if their dog walks in a perfect heel staring at you. Right. Like, that's what every husband wants or every guy. And I hate to be stereotypical, but it's always a guy. It's always a guy. They're like, well, I want my dog to walk right by my side and be staring at me. And I'm, but nobody wants to do the work. Right. So, right. They're just happy if their dog, like, doesn't go to the bathroom in the house and doesn't, uh, kill people when they walk in the door as far as jumping on them and torturing them can't eat the children like the basic rules of life yeah i've even found like recall to be pretty low on the totem pole for a lot of folks because they have a fenced in yard or they or have an electric, electric fence. fence um and to me i mean it just offers so much freedom to be able to bring you know bring my dog to a completely open field and play fetch with them i can remember even about Two months ago, maybe I went down to visit some friends and he was a little cooped up uh, in the house with them. So I was able to just go to a completely unfenced area and just throw the ball for him for like 15 minutes and tire him out. And that's really important to me. But I think for some people, you know, they just have different living situations. If they have a fenced in yard or an electric fence, like it just doesn't seem to be as important to them. But anyway, I think it's important for like younger couples who don't have kids yet. Yep. Because they travel so much and they want to bring their dog with them. Yep. And it's like the whole process of life. I've seen so many people who are single and then they get with somebody and then they get a dog. You know, they, they travel together and then they get a house and then they have kids. And I feel like that's been the most successful. Those people are the most successful with dog training. I feel like the... The person who needs a do- needs a dog, they don't want a dog, or their kid's not pestering them to get a dog. I feel like it's the person who wants a friend, and then they do everything to help that friend. Right. And they have a great dog, and then somebody enters their life, and now two people get to share this great dog, and then they have a family. And I feel like, in most cases, it's a really smooth transition. Hmm. I feel like parents who are forced to get a dog because their kids are screaming at them or they think they're forced to get, nobody's forced to do anything they don't want to, especially in a, you know, a a 30 to 40 year old adult, your kid can't tell you what to do. But I see those people have much more difficulty um, training and creating a bond with their dog than the single person who needed a friend. Hmm. But like I said, I have, I mean, there are, I do have a few families where the moms just bonded so heavily with the dog. Because they're always with them. Yeah, they're always with them. Yeah. Yeah, you've always said that the mom has to be the one to want the dog if they're going to be the one spending the time. That's what the trainer told me when I first started training. Yeah, it's true. The mom has to want the dog because they pretty much... It's always the mom in my case. 90 out of 100 times. It it is a few times I've ever heard the dad say, this is my dog. I really wanted a dog. Right. We have a couple. Sometimes the dads don't even show up to the class. Yeah. 90 out of 100 is the mom. Just my personal opinion. (laughs) I would have to agree with that. One comes to mind. I won't name drop because who knows. But. (laughs) That little that little auctioned uh, chocolate lab that we take care of. I didn't say his name. Uh, I have I have no comment. His dad loves him. 
His dad does love his him. Dad, his mom loves him, too, but his dad really loves him. Yeah, they want to be bros. He needed a bro. He did. And it's so funny. It was funny. a bromance. Yeah, and the mother, their mother-in-law told me the other day, she was so cute, she came out of the house and was like, you know, I remember when he came home with that dog. He was riding in a in a Yuba. In a Yuba. I'm like, in an Uber? Yeah, he took a Yuba from back from the thing that he went to, and he, he there he had him. It was right in his coat. And he just had a little Ziploc bag of dog food. Oh, Lord. <laughs> uh. Surprise. Uh. Yeah. Sometimes the dad, the dad's into it. But I think that it comes down to who is spending the time with the dog during the day, right? And those examples and friends that I have that, you know, guys that stay at home with their kids and work in the evening or whatnot, they... You know, they're the ones spending the time with the dog. I think whoever is going to be spending the most time with the dog, that's the one that the dog is going to bond to if you, you know, if yep. you care. The one who feeds him. No, yes. All right. How are you feeling? You feel good about that? I feel like we can wrap things up. All right. Well, you got to talk into the microphone. I know. Sorry. It's okay. It's hard. All I right. Feel, but I feel like we covered a lot. What if I, you know. We did. Well, we can always do like more episodes. There's no structure to this project. It felt like no structure, actually. Yeah. I felt like I was all over the place. It, it was awesome. Did great. Anyway, Fit Pet Boston Talks. Please check out our social media pages. Laurie's social media pages are ABC Dog Training. Yeah, I'm going to say the name of your company, Laurie. A Better Companion Dog Training. Um, look us up on Facebook, Instagram, Pip Pet Boston, ABC Dog Training. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Stay tuned for episode three. Maybe we'll do a Laurie's Lodato take two. But I have a couple people that are ready to sit down with us. So I'm excited. I'm excited for this project. All right. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.